بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إننا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشى ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن دعوة لا يستجاب لها أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم الله بياكم محبتي في الله to the fourth class of this course explaining 40 hadith on revering the Quran and today we are continuing with the 15th hadith in this compilation and we will end at the 26th hadith بإذن الله تعالى so let's begin with what the authors جزاهم الله خيرا compiled here on the right hand side of the screen, alhamdulillah, you can see the Arabic. And on the left hand side of the screen is the translation, which we have prepared to the best of our ability. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. In the 15th hadith, the authors, they said, Min al-Qur'ani layli bi shay'in minhu. That from the ways of revering the Qur'an, honoring the Qur'an, respecting the Qur'an, and developing those characteristics of the Qur'an is by establishing the night prayers with a portion from it. And they relay here the hadith of An Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As radiallahu anhuma annahu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam man qama bi ashri ayatin lam yuktab min al-ghafilin wa man qama bi mi'ati ayatin kutiba min al-qanitin وَمَنْ قَامَ بِأَلْفِ آيَةٍ كُتِبَ مِنَ الْمُقَنْطِرِينَ رواه أبو داود وصحه الألباني In this hadith narrated by Abdullah bin Amr رضي الله عنهما May Allah be pleased with them both The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He said Whoever stands to pray with ten verses Will never be recorded among the negligent And whoever stands with a hundred verses Will be recorded among those devoutly obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whoever stands with a thousand verses will be recorded among those with tremendous rewards collected by Abu Dawood and authenticated by Al-Albani. Rahimahumullah. The Prophet's statement, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever stands to pray with ten verses, من قام بأشر آيات لم يكتب من الغافلين will never be recorded among the negligent. Who are considered to be the negligent? It is clarified in a verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ تَدَرُّعًا وَخِيفَةً وَدُونَ الْجَهْرِ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ بِالْغُتُوِّ وَالْأَصَالِ وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ To remember your Lord inwardly fi nafsika with humility and reverence. تَدَرُّعًا وَخِيفَةً وَدُونَ الْجَهْرِ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ and in a moderate tone of voice, bil wal asal, both morning and evening, wala takum min al ghafini, and do not be among those who are heedless. Do not be among those who are heedless. So we understand from this verse that those who are heedless are those who do not remember their Lord. Yani those who do not make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greatest form of remembrance of Allah is by reciting his book, the Qur'an. So whoever leaves off reciting the book of Allah, then they're considered to be among the negligent. How can you prevent yourself from being among the negligent? Is mentioned in this hadith. مَنْ قَامَ بِعَشْرِ آيَاتٍ لَمْ يُكْتَبْ مِنَ الْغَافِينَ The least amount that you can do in order to not be among the ghafinin is to recite 10 verses from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, then said, وَمَنْ قَامَ بِمِئَةِ آيَةٍ كُتِبَ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ Whoever increases in that and stands by reciting a hundred verses will be recorded among those devoutly obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word al-qanit in the Arabic language is very important to understand because it comes with different meanings depending on the context in the Qur'an. So you'll see this word often being used in the Qur'an and each verse has a specific meaning. The meaning of qanit, as mentioned by Shihabuddin ibn Raslan, can come with the meaning of الطائعين لله يعني those who are obedient, who perform ta'at, acts of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Qanits can also take the meaning of al khashi' yani those who have khushur in their salawat, in their movements, in their haya, in their life. Also, it can take the meaning of al musallin those who are praying. Al abid, a qanit can be an abid, a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Al qanit can also take the meaning of al qaim, yani those who establish the obligations of Allah subhanahu wa taala, the fara'id of Allah azza wa jalla, and stay away from the prohibitions. Those are the different meanings of qanit in the Arabic language, and you find in the Quran. In this instance, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, كتب من القانتين, and because it's in a general state, القانت, القانتين, it includes all of those meanings. It includes الطائعين, الخاشعين, المصلين, العابدين, القائمين, and the other meanings of the word القانت, subhanAllah. So by simply reciting how many? A hundred ayat that person is from the Qanitin. Ya Allah, make us all among the Qanitin. I mean, and then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Woman qama bi alfi ayatin kutiba min al muqantirin." Whoever stands with a thousand verses will be recorded among those with tremendous rewards. Now, in the explanations of this hadith. Like Sahib al Aulin Ma'bud. Uh, he mentions Al Muqantirin takes the meaning of abundant wealth, yani malan kathiran, and the intent is tremendous rewards that a person who recites a thousand verses will be recorded among those with tremendous rewards. Abdul Azim al Munziri, he said in his Mukhtasar, his explanation, that from the Surah Al-Mulk, if you were to look in the Mus'haf, from Surah Al-Mulk to the end of the Mus'haf, Surah Al-Nas is around 1,000 verses. It's around 1,000 verses to give you an idea of how much a person should recite. This is an example. So if you want to be among the Muqantireen, recite the last two juz of the Qur'an or recite juz'an min al-Qur'an and that will equate to 1,000 verses more or less. Now, as for what the authors have written related to the beautiful cultivating benefits, the ta'if tarbawiyya, derived from this hadith, then they said here, رَضُّ مَنَازِلِ السَّائِرِينَ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِالْقُرْبِ وَالصِّلَةِ بِالْقُرْآنِ That connecting the stations of the travelers to Allah through their closeness and connection to the Qur'an. Yani there's a direct connection between Becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recital of the Quran. If you want to have a close connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to strengthen your relationship with the Quran. And the best way of doing so is by establishing the night prayers, is by establishing the night prayers. Naam. And that's affirmed throughout the Quran, throughout the Sunnah. For example, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to rise at nighttime and pray optional prayers. To pray the optional prayers at nighttime. Asa ayyaba'athaka rabbuka maqama mahmuda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said right after that, so that your Lord may raise you to a station of praise. Maqam al-Mahmuda. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah bihamdi. Yani the night prayers are extremely important for every Muslim. Especially, especially for the da'i in Allah, for the caller to Allah. And that the night prayers is the thing that will raise your station, both in this life and more importantly in the hereafter. The night prayers will raise your station because of the numerous benefits contained within. One, it's the greatest means of obtaining and strengthening your sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your ikhlas, may Allah make us all among the mukhlisin, is that if you want to increase in your sincerity, your ikhlas, then get up at night when everyone is sleeping and develop a connection with your Lord. Now focus on yourself and your Lord. Also, read the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Night prayers, of course, the thing that you're doing the most is reading the speech of Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you read the speech of Allah with contemplation, with a clear mind, a clear heart, the closer you will get to Allah and develop your sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. Also, Allah Azza wa Jalla mentioned in the Quran, Laysu sawa'a, that they are not all alike. Min ahl al kitabi ummatun qa'imatun yatluna ayatin lahi ana al layli wa hum yastudun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are not all alike. Among the people of the book are those who are upright, standing in prayer, reciting the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the night. Ana al layli wa hum yastudun. Prostrating in prayer. Yani, even among the previous nations, you found that among the righteous were those who stood up in the night prayer reciting the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jalla, which shows the virtue of reciting the revelation of Allah at night during the optional prayers. Now, also we have a hadith which indicate the virtue of night prayers and reciting the book of Allah, like the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Abdullah bin Amr when he said, Ya Abdullah, O oh Abdullah, la takun mithla fulan. Do not be like so-and-so. Kani yaqumu min al-layli fataraka qiyam al-layl. Collected by Imam Bukhari, a Muslim. Do not be like fulan, so-and-so. He used to stand a portion of the night in prayer, then he abandoned it. He left it off. SubhanAllah. Naam. And there are many other virtues as it relates to Standing up in the night prayers. One of the books that I advise everyone to read is a book entitled Fadl Qiyam al Layl by Al Imam Abu Bakr Muhammad bin Hussein Al Ajurri. Al Ajurri, he has a wonderful book entitled Fadl Qiyam al Layl, The Virtue of the Night Prayers. And there's a wonderful explanation for this book by Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. I advise everyone to try to read it, listen to it, benefit from it. Uh, it should be translated by now. This this has been out for more than 10 years or so. So I'm sure it's been translated by now. And it mentions and it will encourage you uh, in standing up for the night prayers. Now, so there's a clear connection between your closeness to Allah and reciting the Quran, especially at night. Especially at night. Now, um, here the author has said one of the greatest ways the greatest ways to establish a connection with the Quran is by al qiyamu bihi fil layli walaw bi shay'in qalil is to engage in night prayer with the Quran even if it's for a short period of time now you don't have to stand up the whole entire night with the Quran in order to obtain this virtue La, rather you can stand up for a short period of time based on your capability, based on your circumstance. Now, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, he said, Ahabul A'mali ilallahi adwamuha wa in qal that the most beloved actions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those which are done consistently wa in qal, even if they are few. Now, and it's mentioned that the sahaba, whenever they would perform an act of worship, they would Yani they would become firm in performing it consistently. They would stick to it. Subhanallah. This is from the guidance of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as well as his companions radiallahu anhum. That they will perform actions and they will be consistent in it. Even if they were few. The goal is not to perform a lot of acts of worship. Rather the goal is to what? Perform of course, after the obligations to perform the acts of worship, you can do consistently. Now, and consistency is the key for success, Ikhwani Akhawat, even if it's few. So you don't have to stand up the whole entire night. You can maybe wake up, if you're not praying night prayers right now, you can wake up maybe five minutes before Fajr and just pray two rakah. Start with two rakah. Do that on a consistent basis for a week. And you will see after two weeks, after a month, you will increase. You will naturally want to get up a little bit earlier to pray even more for rakah, right? And you do that consistently. And then you next week, you'll pray six and eight until you pray the sunnah of what Prophet Muhammad SAW used to pray. So consistency is the key, ikhwani akhawat. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, He loves, He loves when we are consistent in our worship. As the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, he mentioned in the hadith, 
upon you is to do what is within your capacity, what you're able to do without overtaxing yourselves, without going above and beyond. Now, and then he said, For wallahi, by Allah, la yamallahu hatta tamallu. That certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not get tired of giving rewards, but surely you will get tired in performing acts of worship. SubhanAllah. Look at the generosity of Allah and how no matter how much you do, Allah will always give you rewards provided you are sincere and it's upon the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And Allah never gets tired of doing so. However, it is you, the creation, you, antum, antum al fuqara Allah. You are the ones who get tired. Now I'm in performing acts of worship. So he said after that, وَكَانَ أَحَبَّ الدِّينِ إِلَيْهِ مَا دَامَ عَلَيْهِ صَاحِبُهُ And the best or the most beloved deen, act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or way of life, or action, or habits, that which is most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are those actions in which a person performs consistently. The point of the matter is to be consistent in our acts of worship, even if those acts of worship are few. And a dua, a beautiful dua, I advise everyone to memorize and to recite that will help you, inshallah ta'ala, and being consistent is a dua that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu would recite before he ended his prayer, after the tashahid, he would say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma, everyone should memorize this. A very short, easy dua to memorize. Allahumma, O oh Allah, a'inni, assist me ala dhikrika in making your remembrance wa shukrika and showing gratitude to you, being grateful for what you have given me wa husni ibadatik. Now, a beautiful dua that we all should recite after making the tashahud and before making taslim, before you say assalamu alaikum rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. And just a point I want to highlight, if you've completed your tashahud, your durud, as they say, the adhkara and the ad'iyah of the tashahud, and the imam has not completed his yet, and he has not made taslim, you should not sit there quiet. This is a big mistake. You should not sit there quiet. Rather, you should use that time to make dua. Make dua. Learn more dua that the Prophet ﷺ would make during the tashahid. And memorize it and recite it. And among those ad'iya is this one right here. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Now, remember when you're in salah, you're worshipping Allah. And this is the greatest time when your ad'iya, when your supplications will be answered. So make use of that time by making adhkar, making ad'iyah, making supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So learn what he used to say. Another dua that he would say at this moment was Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an -nar. That's another dua he would recite in this portion of the prayer after making tashahud. Tayyib, take advantage of these times in the salah and do not waste one moment. Do not waste one moment, ikhwani wa khawat. Rather, take advantage of the salah and focus on what you're saying. Learn the meanings of what you're saying. This is what's going to help you in your life. Naam, the more you perfect your salah, ikhwani wa khawat, the more focus in your salah, subhanAllah, you'll see the effect of that in the rest of your affairs. Your salah, it's ajib, yani something amazing, that your salah has a direct effect on the quality of your life. The more effort you put into perfecting your salah, subhanAllah, you see that Allah will facilitate your affairs throughout the day. And if you were to, may Allah protect us all, neglect your salah, then you see that your days contains less barakah. It contains less barakah and less assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So focus on your prayers, ikhwani wa akhwat. Learn the meaning of every word that comes out your mouth in the salah. Now, may Allah grant us all success in this affair. I mean, these are some points highlighted by the authors. As it relates to how you can implement this hadith, the authors, they said, to strive in praying at night with the Quran, even if it's only 10 verses. Now, even if it's only 10 verses. So this should, this is like a guideline 
uh, what's the least amount of verses that you should recite? It should be at least 10. Naam. So in two raka'ah, I'm sure you can find two surahs that are at least 10 verses from the Quran. Surah Al-Fatiha has seven verses right there. Walay alhamd. Also, how you can implement this hadith, Sabiq Wartaqi fi manazil sa'irin ila Allahi bil Qur'ani fahu al ghina al haqiqi. Compete and ascend in the stations of the travelers to Allah through the Quran, for it is the true contentment. Naam. Compete with one another in obtaining higher levels in Jannah through the Quran. Allah Akbar. The next hadith we have, hadith number 16. And it states, Tajul Karama li Hamil al Quran, the crown of honor for the carrier of the Quran. This hadith is narrated by Abu Huraira and Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu, and in the Bi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and who call Yaji al Quran, Yom al Qiyamati, Payakulu Yarabi Halihi, Payulbasu Tajal Karama, Thumma Yakulu Yarabi Zidhu, Payulbasu Hulla tal Karama, Thumma Yakulu Yarabi Rda anhu, Payarda anhu. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ إِقْرَأْ وَرْقَى وَيُزَادُ بِكُلِّ آيَةٍ حَسَنَةً Which states that the Qur'an will come on a day of resurrection and will say, O oh Lord, adorn him. So he will be given a crown of honor to wear. Then it will say, O oh Lord, give him more. So he will be given a garment of honor. Then it will say, O oh Lord, be pleased with him. So Allah will be pleased with him. Then it will be said to him, recite and advance in status. And for each verse, you will gain one more hasana, reward for a good deed, collected by Imam Tirmidhi. And he said the hadith was hasan. And it was also uh, given a similar grade by Al-Abani, rahimahumullah ta'ala. His statement, Ya Rabbi Hallihi, meaning Ya Rabbi Zayyinhu. Oh my Lord, Beautify him. Adorn him. And subhanAllah, here we see that Allah Azza wa Jalla will make the Qur'an speak. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. And Allah Azza wa Jalla has the ability to do anything and everything. SubhanAllah. Among the things that will speak on that, that day would be the Qur'an. Now I'm the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, Allah will make siyam, a psalm, fasting, speak on behalf of his companion. Now, and it will intercede on his behalf. Also, from the things that Allah will make speak on that day are our body parts. Allah Akbar. Aliyoma nakhtimu ala afwahihim. Today we have sealed their mouths. Watukalimuna aidihim. And their hands will speak to us. SubhanAllah. Think about that, Ikhwan and Akhwat. Look at your hands right now. Look at your hands right now, Ikhwan and Akhwat. And know for sure that these body parts will speak for or against you on that day. So be wise. Be wise, be smart in what you use your hands for. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to use this amana, this trust that He has given us, our bodies. In his obedience, Allahumma Amin. And there are many other things in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will make speak on that day. Among them are inanimate objects, the earth, and many other affairs. In this hadith, it highlights the Quran will speak. Subhanallah, the Quran will speak, and it will say for its companion, it will make du'a, "Oh Lord, adorn him." It will beg Allah to adorn him, and he will be given a crown of honor to wear. Then it will say, O Allah, give him more. And he will be given a garment of honor. And then it will be said, O Allah, O my Lord, be pleased with him. So Allah will be pleased with him. Then it will be said to him, recite and advance in status. And for each verse, you will gain one more hasana, reward for a good deed. From the benefits derived from this hadith, it's mentioned by the authors, عَظَمَةُ الْقُرْآنِ وَبَرَكَتُهُ لَا تَنْقَطِعُ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينِ That the greatness and blessings of the Qur'an never cease until the Day of Judgment. 
subhanAllah, that the time that you spend in the Quran, ikhwani akhawat, right now, today, while you're in the dunya, the barakah doesn't stop at your recital when you finish reciting, right? Just receiving hasanat, that's it. La, rather the barakah continues while you're alive and it affects you, your daily affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you in your day because of your recital of the Quran. And he facilitates your affairs. And not only that, it will defend you on the day of judgment. It will make dua for you on the day of judgment. As mentioned in this hadith. Subhanallah bihamdi. Subhanallah bihamdi. And when you recognize this and you understand this, then subhanAllah, what's stopping us from spending more time with the Qur'an and prioritizing the Qur'an in our daily schedule and making the Qur'an our priorities? Naam, what's stopping us from, from doing so? This The Qur'an is a true investment that we'll see later on in this compilation. That if a person wants to be successful in this life and the next, spend more time, invest more of your time with the Qur'an. Also, what the author mentioned here, Adhamatul Qur'ani fi kulli ayatin min ayatihi. The greatness of the Qur'an is in every verse. Fi kulli ayatin min ayatihi. You see the greatness of the Qur'an in all of his verses. Now, the greatness of the Qur'an can be seen in every verse. As I mentioned here, in every verse. Also from the benefits of the hadith, Naf'u wa barakatul Qur'ani sababun li nayni ridwan illahi wa u'ali jinan that the benefit and blessings of the Qur'an is a cause for obtaining Allah's pleasures, Allah's pleasure, and lofty gardens in paradise. طيب, the benefit and blessings of the Qur'an is a cause for obtaining Allah's pleasure and lofty gardens in paradise. Naam. The pleasure of Allah, ikhwani akhawat, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ That the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest bliss. Subhanallah. In the same verse, in Surah Tawbah, Allah before this mentions about Jannah. And then Allah says, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ That Allah's pleasure is greater than the Jannah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And the author, as I said here, that from the means of obtaining the Rudwan of Allah is by benefiting from the Qur'an, reciting the Qur'an. Now, and because the pleasure of Allah is one of the greatest pleasure, greatest blessings of Allah, we find that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu would often make dua, invoking Allah for his pleasure. It's a dua that he would recite: "Allahumma zidna wa la tanqusna, wa akrimna wa la tuhinna, wa a'atina wa la tahrimna, wa athirna wa la tuthir alina, wa ardina." The dua the Prophet Muhammad would say, وَأَرْضِنَا وَرْضَعَنَّا O oh Allah, make us content with what you have given us and be pleased with us. And be pleased with us. Also the another dua that he would say while traveling, اللهم إنا نسألك البر والتقوى ومن العمل ما ترضى O oh Allah, we ask you for البر والتقوى and we ask you actions. We ask you to grant us actions that you are pleased with, that which you are pleased with. Now, so the Prophet of Allah وسلم, would make dua to obtain Allah's pleasure. And among the ways of obtaining Allah's pleasure is spending time and implementing the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, they said after that, عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ مَا يُعْطِي الْعَبْدُ مِن نَفْسِهِ لِلْقُرْآنِ يَنَالُ مِنَ الْأَجْرِ وَالْمَكَانَةِ The extent of what the servant gives to the Qur'an will determine what he obtains of reward and stature. Now, the more time you put in understanding and memorizing and implementing the Qur'an, the greater the reward you will receive from Ar-Rahman. And the more that Allah Azza wa Jalla will raise your status. Like the example that we saw earlier with Ibn Abza, who was a free slave. But because he was Sahib al-Qur'an, and he was knowledgeable of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised his status and made him the governor, the interim governor of Mecca. Allahu Akbar. Um, from the ways of implementing this hadith, they say, أَحْسِنِ الصِّلَةَ بِالْقُرْآنِ يُحْسِنِ الْقُرْآنُ إِلَيْكِ 
better your connection with the Quran and the Quran will be good to you. Now, as we see many examples, subhanAllah, and this is derived from the principle al jazaa min jins al-amal. Yani if the reward is based on the action. The reward is based on the action. The more good, the more time you spend the Quran, the greater the reward. They also say, Ta'amal ma al Qurani, Mu'amala ta sahibi was sadiq al wafi. Interact with the Quran as you would with a companion and a loyal friend. Now, you think about your friends, your companions, right? You put a lot of effort and time in developing your relationship with them. Nam. Well, we should do more than that with the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is the true friend. The Qur'an is the true friend that will never leave you, that will never disgrace you. Rather, it will defend you. Rather, it will be a proof for you, subhanAllah, on a day of judgment. Rather, it will benefit you in the hereafter. So it only makes sense to spend more effort with the Qur'an. Also they say here, عَلِّقْ قَلْبَكَ بِبَرَكَاتِ وَخَيْرَاتِ الْقُرْآنِ كُلِّهِ سُوَرِهِ وَآيَاتِهِ To attach your heart with the blessings and goodness of the entire Qur'an. His chapters and verses. Now. Hadith number 17, it states Al-Qur'an al-Azim wasiyatun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the magnificent Qur'an is the Prophet's final advice given to his sahaba, his companions. Here we have a hadith an Talha ibn Musarrif who was from the uh, kibar tabi'een, from the scholars among the tabi'een. Uh, in fact, he was from the Qurra among them. He asked the Sahabi, Sa'altu Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa, radiallahu anhuma. I asked Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa, both who were companions, radiallahu anhuma. He witnessed the battle of Hudaybiyah and died 87 years after Hijrah. Hal kana nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam awsa? Did the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make a will yani to appoint his successor or bequeath wealth? He replied, فَقُلْتُ لَا فَقَالَ لَا He said, no. Abdullah said, no. فَقُلْتُ سَطَلْحَ said, كَيْفَ كُتِبَ عَلَى النَّاسِ الْوَصِيَّةُ أَوْ أُمِرُوا بِالْوَصِيَّةُ How is it prescribed then for the people to make wills and they are ordered to do so while the Prophet of Allah وسلم, did not make any will? Yani how is an obligation? But the Prophet وسلم, did not do it. Writing wills. Abdullah, he said, That the Prophet of Allah, وسلم, he advised holding firm to the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. This hadith collected by Bukhari and Muslim, and the wording is in Bukhari. طيب. There are a couple things in this hadith that we should have a backstory understanding of. The first of which is that they are ordered to do so is in reference to the concept of writing a will. Before, writing a will was considered to be an obligation. It was first considered to be an obligation that everyone had to do. And if it did not do it, then it was a sin. It was a wajib. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتُ إِن تَرَكَ خَيْرًا الْوَصِيَّةُ لِلْوَالِدَيْنِ وَالْأَقْرَبِينَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ حَقًّا عَلَى الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Kutiba alaykum, that it is prescribed upon you. Yani furida alaykum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made an obligation upon you all that whenever death approaches any one of you, if they leave something of value behind, they have wealth with them, khayran, in taraka khayran, for them to write down a will for their parents and their immediate family members. This is an obligation. Haqqan ala muttaqeen. Tayyip. So the Sahaba understood this to be an obligation and Talha and Abdullah did understood it to be an obligation طيب, because of this clear verse. All right. This is why Talha asked, what did the Prophet of Allah make as a will? It's an obligation. Prophet Muhammad should have done it. طيب. 
And he asked Abdullah, did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi make a will? And Abdullah said, no. That's the reason for the question where he said, كَيْفَ كُتِبَ عَلَى nas al How is it prescribed for the people to write a will? And the Prophet Sallallahu did not do it. This is why he was confused. But then Abdullah remembered that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi did not make a will. Rather, he gave a parting advice, which it was to stick to the Book of Allah. This verse in Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed before the rulings related to inheritance were revealed. So we understand that it was an obligation to write a will. But then the ruling was uplifted. There was a nasikh. There was nasikh mansukh. That there was an abrogation. That this ruling, obligation of writing a will, was abrogated with the ayat related to inheritance. Okay, then came the rulings of inheritance. As mentioned by half of the Hakim in Islamia, he said, يعني, Once the ayat of mawarith were revealed, now writing a will was no longer an obligation, but it was a recommendation. طيب. And this is what's mentioned by Ibn Umar. He said, نُسِخَتْ هَذِي الْآيَةُ بِآيَةِ الْمِيرَاثِ that the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah about the obligation of writing a will was abrogated with the ayat of Al-Mirath. As well as Ibn Abbas, he said, That it was abrogated by the verse mentioned in Surah Al-Nisa, the beginning of Surah Al-Nisa. That for men, there's a share in what their parents and close relatives leave behind after they have died. Also, we have the prophet statement وسلم, to show the abrogation of obligation of writing a will. In Allah qad a'ta li kulli dhi haqqin haqqahu fala wasiyyata li warith. That certainly Allah has given everyone who deserves or has a right. Allah has given them their rights. Yani through inheritance, through mirath. Okay. Fala wasiyyata li warith. So there's no will for the one who inherits. Collected by at-Tirmidhi. So, uh, scholars have said that Talha did not know. The reason why he made this say this question is because Talha was not aware of the abrogation. As well as, uh, mentioned by Ibn Hajar, Abdullah was not aware of the abrogation. There's some Sahaba who had more knowledge of the Quran and what was abrogated. Because of them sticking with the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam for a longer period, especially towards the end of his life, they were more aware of that which was abrogated. So th this Sahabi Abdullah and the Tabi'i Talha were not aware of the abrogation of the obligation of writing a will. So this is why we have this conversation. al kullin writing a will is considered to be recommended. Ibn Hajr, he mentions in Fath al-Bari that Abdullah's negation, the first time he said no, that he not leave behind a, a will or a parting advice, he said no because he thought the question was about a specific will. Yani, did he appoint a successor, a khalifa, due to the context of that time? The Prophet died. Now the tabi wants to know, did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu advise or write a will appointing his successor? So he said no. Also, it could take the meaning of no in terms of possessions. طيب. Then he said that he advised holding firm to the book of Allah. He advised, he did not write a will, but he advised to hold firm to the book of Allah. Now, as the word can take the meaning of advising, right? giving a parting advice, giving a final advice, and it can also take the meaning of writing a will. So this word also has two meanings. He changed the meaning to mean something else. طيب. So no, he didn't leave a will behind, but rather he gave a final parting advice. This is what should be understood from this hadith. And he used the same verb, but he used the second meaning for it, or another meaning for it. Was this the last advice given by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Before his death, 
What do you all think? Was this the last advice given by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Yani also bi kitab Allah. We have other narrations that state otherwise. For example, it's reported that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, "Kana akhiru kalami Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as as salata ittaqullaha fi ma malakat aymanukum." The last words he said, the last words in which the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke were the prayer, the prayer, yani meaning hold firm to your prayers, hold firm to your prayers. Fear Allah, have taqwa of Allah about those whom your right hands possess. Cut it by Abu Dawood. Tayyip. Also we have another narration cut by Imam Bukhari that Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, we know that the Messenger of Allah died in between her arms. Naam? And she said, قالت, فكانت آخر كلمة تكلم بها اللهم الرفيق الأعلى. The last words that he said was, O oh Allah, in the highest abode. In the highest abode. طيب. So how do we reconcile between these narrations and other narrations that mention other things as it relates to the last words of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Scholars have said that as it relates to what Abdullah, the hadith we have here, Awsa bi kitabillah, this is from the last things in which he advised. It's not the absolute last words that came out of his mouth, but it's among the last things that he advised. And Abdullah mentioned Awsa bi kitabillah because this is the greatest, the greatest advice and he hold firm to the book of Allah. If you hold firm to the book of Allah, then you will not be misguided after that. So that was highlighted because of its importance. As for the Prophet's statement narrated by Ali, as-salata, as-salata, then this is from the last things the Prophet ﷺ mentioned as relates to rulings. Yani the rulings, ahkam. As-salata, as-salata. He encouraged the people to preserve and hold firm to their prayers. As for the absolute last word that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, then it was mentioned by Aisha, Allahumma rafiq al-a'la, and of course, kalima la ilaha illallah. Now, so here, Abdullah bin Abi Awfa, he mentions that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi advised the people to hold firm to Allah's book and to implement the teachings and implications of what's in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. As mentioned in another hadith, Taraktu fikum ma in tamasaktum bihi lan tadullu. I left for you all that which, if you hold firm to it, you will never become misguided. What is it? Kitabullah. It is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, those are just a few points of background related to this narration. As for the benefits derived from the hadith, one we see here, Tatajalla alumatul Quran al Karimi. في وصية النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم به والوصية تكون لعظيم وجليل that the greatness of the noble Quran appears in the parting advice of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as parting advices are for great noble affairs. Now, when a person is dying, إخوان وأخوات, they want to highlight the most important affair to those around them. And here we see that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم advised with كتاب الله, and that shows its greatness. Also, al-akhthu bil wasiyati bi kitab illahi sababun lil najati wal falah. Upholding to the advice of Allah's book, yani holding firm to Allah's book, is a cause for success and salvation. And subhanAllah, we see in this hadith the Prophet's lack of interest in the dunya. That he didn't leave behind, he didn't talk about anything worldly. His lasting advice was not anything regarding the dunya. Rather, it was something related to the hereafter, and that which will guide them to Jannah, and that is the Quran. As for implementing the hadith, Ihris ala al-akhdi bi wasiyat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa hiya al-amalu bil Quran. Strive in implementing the Prophet's advice, implementing the Quran. Advise with what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised with. Now, a person gives you, ask for advice. What should you do? What should you advise them with? You should advise them to stick to the Quran, stick to the speech of Allah. And the son of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, 
Third, we see ihris ala su'ali an ilmi wa kulli ma yanfa'uk. Strive in inquiring about knowledge and everything that benefits you. Now, look at how Talha, the great tabi'i, his thirst for knowledge, asking about the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa even about his last moments on earth. Yani, when he's about to die, what did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leave behind? Did he write down a will? What did he do? Look at their thirst for knowledge, Ikhwani al-Khawat. They wanted to learn everything about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even his last moments on earth, so that they can benefit from it and implement it in their lives. SubhanAllah. And this is what led to the success of the Salaf. First three generations among the Sahaba and Tabi'in, Atba'i Tabi'in, their severe adherence to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is what led to their success. And that's something that we should do as well. We should strive to learn more about the sunnah and implement it. Because if you leave off the sunnah, then you've opened the door for bid'ah to creep in, for innovations and misguidance to come in. And every misguidance is in the hellfire. We are the billah. As mentioned by the Messenger of Allah, so in every khutbah, that kullu bid'atin dalala, wa kullu dalalatin finnar. We are the billah. That every innovation is misguidance, and every misguidance is in the hellfire. Right, he didn't say that there's a bid'ah hasana, that there's a good bid'ah that will lead to jannah. La abadan, abadan. Rather, he said, "Kullu bid'atin dalala." Every bid'ah innovation in the deen of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is misguidance. And where is that misguidance going to take you? To the fire. May Allah protect us all. So strive in learning the sunnah, implementing the sunnah, and do not be deceived by the callers to the hellfire. Do not be deceived by those who garb themselves with the clothes of Islam, calling you to the hellfire by performing acts of innovation, acts of disobedience, acts which were never, ever practiced by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself, nor his companions, radiallahu anhum. Strive to learn the sunnah and implement the sunnah and stick firm to it and be stern in your adherence to what has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. The next hadith we have, hadith number 18, that the Quran gives priority to its companion while alive and dead. Narrated on Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhumah, Jabir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him. His name is Abu Abdullah, he's also known as Abu Abdul Rahman, and he's also known as Abu Muhammad. These are three kuna which are given to him. Jabir ibn Abdullah, both him and his father were companions. Ibn Amr ibn Haram, ibn Ka'b al-Ansari, al-Salami. He was among those who witnessed the pledge of Aqabah before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu went to make hijrah to Medina. There were pledges of Aqabah where some from the Ansar, some from Medina would come and negotiate with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu making a pledge with him that if he comes to Medina, he'll be safe. Now, before making the migration, Jabir ibn Abdullah was among those who attended these meetings. And he mentioned that the Prophet of Allah وسلم, went out for 21 battles, expeditions, Ghazwa, and he witnessed 19 of them. SubhanAllah. So after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, made the migration, Jabir was with him for a long period and most of his time. And because of that, he witnessed a lot from the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and he narrated the most, he was among those who narrated the most ahadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He was among the al-mukthiruna min al-sahaba, fi riwayah. He narrated 1,540 hadith, okay, and 58 of them are muttafaqun alayh, are agreed upon, collected by both Bukhari and Muslim. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhuma was known for his diligence in seeking knowledge, ikhwani akhwat, especially as a race traveling to seek knowledge. Imam Bukhari has a chapter in his Sahih, which is entitled Babu al Khuruji fi Talib al In, the chapter as it relates to departing to seek knowledge, traveling to seek knowledge. And he said, وَرَحَلَ جَابِرُ بِعَبْدِ اللَّهِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا مَسِيرَةَ شَهْرٍ إِلَى عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بِنِي أُنَيْسِ فِي حَدِيثٍ واحد. Allah Akbar. That Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiallahu anhu, he was among the ulama, among the sahaba. He traveled one entire month from Medina to Sham to meet 
Abdullah ibn Unais in order to hear just one hadith. Subhanallah bihamdi. Look at his severe love for the hadith of the Messenger وسلم, and how much he would sacrifice in order to obtain it. As we know, traveling, especially back then where there was no ACs, there were no cars. It was extremely hard to travel, ikhwani wa khawats. Now, alhamdulillah, it's been made easier. But back then, there was nothing to protect you from the heat. It was just you and your camel. Allah musta and your caravan. That's it. He traveled a whole entire month like that. To meet a man just to hear one hadith. Imagine that. Some of us, we won't go to a masjid for a lecture, which contains more than one hadith, inshallah. It contains ayat and a hadith and more than that. But Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiallahu anhuma, traveled a whole entire month for only one hadith. What great examples. And this is why it's important for us to learn about them as well and learn about their seerah so they can motivate us in our affairs, our daily affairs. And there's a beautiful statement mentioned by a shaykh. They said, Man lam yakun ruhala, la yakun lahu ruhala. Man lam yakun ruhala, this is the proper pronunciation, yani whoever is not abundant in their traveling and seeking knowledge, la yakun lahu ruhala. Then no one will travel to them to seek knowledge. If they don't travel themselves to seek knowledge, then people will not travel to them. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And because Jabir traveled a lot to seek knowledge, it's mentioned in his biography, collected by Iwakir in his Musannaf, that Hisham ibn Urwa, he said about Jabir that he had a circle of knowledge in the Prophet's Masjid. He had a whole chair for himself, or a circle of knowledge, halaqa, in the Prophet's Masjid, where people will come and travel and seek knowledge from him. SubhanAllah. You see how. When he was a student, he would travel, seek knowledge, and now how Allah Azza wa honored him with a seat in the Prophet's Masjid, وسلم, where people sought knowledge from him. Naam, hakadha, hakadha talibayim ya khuna akhwat. And everyone should travel to the best of their ability. If you can't travel abroad, a different city, at least travel to your masjid, right? Get out your house and travel to your masjid. If you can't do that, then at least turn on your phone and listen to a lecture. Everyone has to do what is in accordance to their ability. Now, Jabir died in Medina during his 70, it said 78 years after Hijrah. And he was 94 years old. Radiallahu anhuma. Now, so that's a little bit about the great Sahabi. He narrates in this hadith, Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana Bukhari. You can read the translation here. Just a few things I want to highlight. The word lahad. Lahad is in reference to the translation says here niche. There's a niche in the grave. Yani meaning that when you bury someone, what we're familiar with in the West, at least, is that you dig straight down and then you place the dead there and then you cover them and then you start piling the dirt back on them, right? The laht is once you dig down, you dig a side hole or a niche on the side, okay? And that niche, that side hole, is what's referred to as a lahd. It should be big enough where you place the body. And you place the body on the right side facing towards the qibla. This is referred to as lahd. Okay? Sometimes it's difficult to dig that niche because of the material, the hardness of the underground. It's difficult to dig through it. So, in that case, a person would suffice with something called shaq. Shaq is basically you dig down and then you cover the dead, the deceased, with a barrier. And then on top of that barrier, you start shoveling the dirt over them. So that's the difference between a laht, which is a side niche, and shaq. Alakul in both cases, dirt is not directly placed on the deceased. That's something important that we should know. That dirt is not placed directly on the deceased. If you don't have any other means, then that what you can do. But alhamdulillah, in today's day and age, it's very easy to prepare the dead. Um, so that's regarding a lahd. As for the benefits derived from the hadith, we see that the companion of the Qur'an is given precedence while he is alive as well as when he is passed away. Um, in this instance, we see Sahib al-Qur'an is given precedence when he dies, right? At the time of being buried. 
when he is alive, what's an example of the companion of Quran given precedence when he's alive? For example, the Salah, leading the Salah. يَوْمُ الْقَوْمَ أَقْرَأْهُمْ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ Right? فَإِنْ كَانُوا فِي الْقِرَاءَةِ سَوَاءً فَأَعْلَمُهُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ As mentioned in hadith, that the person who knows the most Quran, who recites the Quran the best, who implements the Quran the best, leads the people in the Salah. The companion of the Quran is given precedence even in the hereafter. How is that? يُقَالَ لِصَاحِبِ الْقُرْآنِ إِقْرَأْ وَارْتَقِ وَرَتِّلْ كَمَا كُنْتَ تُرَتِّلُ فِي الدُّنْيَا SubhanAllah. That it determines their last position in paradise. And they ascend based off of how much the Qur'an they used to recite in the dunya. Now, they mention here the criterion for superiority between the people of virtue in the worldly life and hereafter is implementing the Qur'an. طيب. As for how we can implement this hadith, take the Qur'an and strive in accompanying it. You'll become favored. Let your criterion for superiority be the Qur'an and its implementation. طيب, uh, we have a couple more hadith we want to go over, so let's uh, go through it quickly. Hadith number 19. Here we have honoring the Quran by observing the etiquette of reciting out loud or silently. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, spent the night at the masjid. He retired in the masjid. وسلم, في المسجد. So he heard the people يجهرون, He heard the people being loud in their recital of the Quran. So he opened and he removed the curtain. وقال, Certainly each of you are conversing with his Lord quietly. فَلَا يُؤْذِيَنَّ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا So one should not harm the other. وَلَا يَرْفَعْ بَعْضُكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ فِي الْقِرَاءَةِ Nor should they raise their voice in recital. أَوْ قَالَ فِي الصَّلَةِ Or in prayer over the voice of another. Now, from the benefits of the hadith, it mentioned here, from the ways of honoring the Quran is not to raise your voice while reciting it. Now, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Rabbaka Remember your Lord inwardly with humility and reverence and in a moderate tone. Yani do not be loud, boisterous with your recital of the Quran, subhanAllah. Also, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wala tajharu bi salatika, wala tukhafit biha. Do not recite in your prayers too loudly or too silently, but seek a way in between. Now, also we have another narration. In Sahih Muslim, Abu Musa al-Ashari, he said, Kunna ma Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we were with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in, in uh, traveling. This refers to um, them returning back from the battle of Khaybar. And the people started to become loud with their takbir, saying Allahu Akbar. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Ayyuha nas, O oh people, irba'u ala anfusikum. Yani, be gentle with yourselves. Innakum laysa tad'una asam wala ghaiban. Certainly you are not invoking who is deaf nor absent. Innakum tad'una sami'an qariban. Certainly you all are invoking Sami'an Qariban. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can hear and he is near. And he is with you all. And he is with you all. SubhanAllah. So the origin, ikhwani akhwat, when it comes to making dua, is to do so in a moderate manner that does not cause harm or disturbance to those around you, which prevents them from making their own dhikr or dua. Right? When we go to the masjid, then we should not be loud in our recital, disturbing those around us. Because everyone came to the masjid to get close to Allah. So why are we preventing other people from doing so with a loud recital, with a loud dhikr? Now, so the origin is what? To be quiet. Except in places where the Prophet of Allah Wasallam is reported that he was loud with his recital or loud with the dhikr. Like for example, when after the salawat, it's mentioned in the hadith that the sahaba would know when the salah was completed, when they would hear the adhkar being recited, meaning they would recite it loudly, okay, audibly. Also, another example of when the Prophet Muhammad was loud with his adhkar or ad'iyah is an hajj, when he would make the talbiyah. 
because the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was asked, Ayul Hajji Afdal, which Hajj is the best? And he said, Al Ajju wa Thaj. Al Ajju wa Thaj. Al Ajju is a reference to Raf'u Sawt bi Talbiya. When you raise your voice in making the Talbiya, saying, La Baik Allahumma La Baik. They would recite it loudly. Tayyip. These are the instances where it is recommended to raise your voice. Other than that, then you should be making dhikr to the point where it does not cause disturbance to others around you and you're moving your lips and your tongue. If you're by yourself, that's a whole different story. You should recite in a way, once again, that doesn't cause disturbance to anyone else around you in different apartments or rooms, etc. Tayyib. Reading the Qur'an is a form of intimate communication with Allah the Almighty. Among the greatest fears that harms the recite of the Qur'an is him ceasing to reflect over it. And if one ceases to ponder over the Qur'an, then how will his reflection be over other affairs? Allah Akbar. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not reflect over the Qur'an? Or are there chains or locks over their hearts? SubhanAllah bihamdi. How can we implement this hadith? Strive in being moderate between reciting the Qur'an loudly and silently. Strive in being moderate between reciting the Qur'an loudly and silently. Being considerate of those around you. Now, sense while you are reciting the Qur'an that you are conversing with your Lord. SubhanAllah. This is a speech of Allah. Be aware of harming anyone during a recital of the Qur'an. Now, we cannot perform acts of worship while harming other people. Uh, hadith number 20, you can see here, let's just simply go to the benefits. You can read the English and Arabic on your own. Uh, the blessing of the Qur'an encompasses its carriers and their parents. Wonderful is the companion of the Qur'an. His good and blessings never cease until the day of standing. The true trade with the Qur'an is implementing it and establishing its verses. Naam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says those who recite the Quran, the book of Allah, and notice what did he say after that? He mentions two acts of worship that they simply don't recite the Quran, but they follow that recital up with action by establishing the prayer and giving that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided them both secretly and hourly while hoping in a trade with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will never perish subhanallah that the true trade with the Quran is what? implementing it and establishing its verses now uh, then they say the believer who implements the rights of the Quran is a true profitable merchant do not become deceived by the lowly by the worldly, lowly life and its adornments. Now, the magnificent blessings and the benefits of the parents cultivating the children upon the Qur'an are prevalent in the world life and hereafter. How can we implement this hadith? They say here, strive in implementing the Qur'an, for it is a profitable trade. Accompany the Qur'an and strive in being in its companionship, for therein is success. Never underestimate the penniless, needy person, person as perhaps he is a companion of the Qur'an, and consequently, blessings and goodness is with him. Strive in cultivating your children and implementing the Qur'an. What an excellent upbringing. Tayyib. Hadith number 21, the Qur'an is a light on earth and a treasure in the heavens. Allah Akbar. From the benefits of the hadith, you can read here, uh, the recitation of the Qur'an is a light through which the servant perceives the realities of affairs. Now, the Qur'an allows you to realize the reality of affairs. It gives you light and insight. Evidence for this is a statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Awaman kana maytan fa'ahyaynahu wa ja'alna lahu nura. Can those who have been dead, to whom we have given life, and a light, yamshi bihi fin nas, which they can walk among the people, kama mathiluhu fi dhulamati laysa bi kharijin minha, be compared to those in complete darkness from those which they can never emerge. Yani. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an as being a nuran, that Allah has rev revived a dead person. And we gave him a light, meaning the Qur'an is a light for an individual. Your recitation of the Qur'an is your investment in the hereafter. 
One of the prominent symbols in achieving piety is the recitation of the Quran. So I'm next to Hadha will suffice with this because just heard that then. Wafakum Allah Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa sallam Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam ajma'i subhanakallahum wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha 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 ilaha